Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Lepp. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Lynn Vincent, author of Indianapolis with Sarah Vladek, and this is The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, we're sitting here in Barnes & Noble on Oceanside. I've got best-selling author Scott Husing sitting with me, co-hosting like he likes to do. And we have Lynn Vincent, best-selling author as well. You guys did a military appreciation day here at the Barnes & Noble, so we appreciate those guys for letting us set up and, and get going. But, um, wow, thanks for writing this book. This is such a powerful story, and a lot of people have told it. I guess the first question we have to ask is, why tell it again? Because it's movies and everything's already been done. What was new that you needed to say? Boy, a lot of people ask us that question, Pete. It's Um, a starting point for sure. What we wanted to do was to elevate Indianapolis above a sinking story. Because most people think of Indianapolis as a ship that sunk and a bunch of guys got eaten by sharks. There Mm. is so much more to it than that. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that Indianapolis was the flagship of the Pacific Fifth Fleet in World War II and that she carried the atomic bomb or components of the atomic bomb, bomb to Tinian Island. Um, So that's one thing we cover. That story has never been told. The entire rescue story has never been told. (laughs) We uh, also put in the Japanese point of view, not just the not just Commander Hashimoto, who was the commander of the submarine that sank Indianapolis, but Emperor Hirohito, Vice Admiral Matome Ugaki, who who was the commander of the kamikaze pilots. So we come at it from a lot of different angles, and we also talk about all the battles that Indianapolis was in. So it's really a history of this very storied ship from the time she was christened in 1932 until actually she was found under three and a half miles of water in 2017. Talking about the ship and so many stories that come out of that, how many people were on the Indy? The crew was... 1,194 crew members on this particular voyage and one very unlucky passenger. Did they, like, buy a ticket at, like, the Costco discount <laughs> ticket store? What, who was a passenger vet on tics. that ticket? Well, it was there actually... There you go, it vet was a cap, It was actually a captain named Edwin Crouch. And huh. when Indianapolis was going to transit westbound across the Philippine Sea... Um, on beginning on July 28, 1945. He was headed for the Philippine Islands, too. So he said, hey, Charlie, talking to his buddy, Captain Charles yeah. McVeigh, can I get a lift? And uh, he did get a lift, and he was not one of the survivors. The point I'm trying to get at is you've got all these passengers, you've got all these sailors, one unlucky you know, vet takes buyer. He's like, goes to Princess Cruises, like, wrong ship, man, don't get yeah. on that. Uh, but you mentioned that you wrote different components of the story so you've essentially got over a thousand different lenses or people that could have told this story obviously some have died some died obviously when the ship sank but all the survivors throughout the years after the war have recollections and how is that how to be an artist to be a writer to try and gather the right pieces to find the right people that can share those stories that haven't been told like that's your start point. like hmm where do i start Yellow Pages, Google Search, how'd you do that? (laughs) Well, how we did it was, uh, first of all, my co-author Sarah Vladek has a 17-year relationship with the survivors. When Mm. she... When she was 13 years old, she saw a documentary about World War II, and Indianapolis was mentioned in just one line. It was the ship that carried the atomic bomb and sank. And she... That struck her. She was like, wow, there's got to be more to this story than that. And how old was she when she was 13. 13. Not a lot of 13-year-olds digging yeah. World War II history. Yeah. So she uh, went to the library because there was no such thing as Google at the time and, and checked it out. And she was like, wow. She wanted to be a filmmaker, and she is a filmmaker today. But at that time, she wanted to tell that story, and she thought, well, somebody will have already told it by the time I'm old enough. But then when she graduated from Pepperdine at uh, age 21, no one had told it yet. Hmm. So she sought out the survivors organization and uh, quickly became friends with the men there and um, after she had been going to their reunions for a few years they asked her to be their official storyteller 
And so um, over the next mm, seven years, from 2005 to about 2011, so that would be six years, she interviewed uh, 107 uh, survivors, mm. about 80 survivors, and the rest um, rescuers and you know people who were actually on the scene. And so she collected all those stories. And then uh, I joined the project in 2011, and we began to collect stories of people who didn't make it because there are a lot, you know, these kinds of stories are usually told by survivors. But we wanted to make sure that the Lost at Sea people were represented as well. Mm. So you asked, out of this universe of people, which includes 1,195 people on the crew, but also all the rescuers. Also. Yeah, the people on the outside looking in. Like, yeah, also. Yeah. What an exhaustive research effort, though. Also, like, this is... Yeah, this is where, uh, you know, you talk about the importance of telling stories. We talk about this a lot. And I I talk to current vets, guys that have just retired or served and the importance of like sharing these stories. So they're not lost in history. They're not lost. I mean, I I did over 75 interviews with my, my Marines, but these guys are all on my iPhone. So I could call them or I could use Google and to have to peel that onion back so many layers to get. You know, the ships that rescued, the families, the survivors, and then to turn the table around from the enemy's perspective and find those whose job was it to reach out to the attackers? Well, we both handled the Japanese point of view, but I mean, you're absolutely right. I had written 10 books before this, every one of them about living people. And so you're right. Mm. You know, if I mean, I like to say if I needed to know something else, I just pick up my phone. But this was completely different than that. By the time I got involved with this project, there were only about a little over 30 survivors left. And so uh, <laughs> two, two things happened. We used a lot of documentary research, journals, letters, handwritten memoirs, um, action reports, court martial, court of inquiry, all things like that. But then how do you, even of that universe, how do you select your characters? And the answer is that some of them self-select sure. just mm-hmm. by the volume of material they've left behind, mm-hmm. right? And then other ones, you know, like, okay, let's say, you know, 20, 20 of the living survivors had an experience of being attacked by a shark. You can't tell 20 of them. You know, they have to be emblematic of they have the to one be. guy that has Perfect. either emblematic. the most horrific shark yeah. attack exactly. or... Something you think is, well, I didn't think that happened during a shark attack. Like, no, I yeah. punched the shark in the nose and he swam away. Right. Like, did, which yeah, I'm, like Lyle Oppenhofer, literally 10 times in the water, as soon as a shark would come swimming by, he would kick it as hard as he could, and every time it worked. Lyle's still alive? Lyle just passed away uh, two years ago. Ah, uh, here's to you, Lyle. I wish Lyle was listening to this. I know, yeah. Lyle was badass. That would have been, yeah. You kick a shark 10 times. Oh, uh, come on now. Badass. If there's a, yeah, if there was a Navy badge for, like, like shark, shark attack. attack. Like why doesn't the Navy have like a ribbon for a surviving a ribbon shark attack? Like silver shark mouth. Yeah, we've got know? we've got all these weird badges uh-huh. and stuff in the military. The army's got the most. You guys hang oh, crap off it. your uniforms yeah. more than anybody. Well, Maybe the Air Force. The, but. There's the Antarctica winter over badge. And then there's the regular Antarctica. Yeah, you badge. get frostbite, you survive a shark attack. Like Lyle should, yeah, all right, I'm gonna create a shark yeah. badge for Lyle and he'll get it posthumously. There is one of the one of the survivors that wears a USS Indianapolis swim team shirt. <laughs> that's great that's great so yeah i mean the, the obvious one is is you you want to hear from and i know we live for a long time but uh, you know captain hashimoto you know because he's he's the guy that's he literally is the last one to see you know see that before the shot is taken well and, the great thing that he did for all of us was he wrote a book called sunk which was written in japanese and published in the 50s mm-hmm. uh and then um translated into uh, English, and then published by Henry Holt and Company in the United States. So this was not just about Indianapolis. There was only one chapter on Indianapolis, but it was his recollection of the entire Japanese uh, submarine war. Mm. And he had a lot of criticism, but it shows his thinking all along the way. So we were able to weave that throughout the whole narrative. Wow. I think that's interesting, historically speaking, from that culture, how how many of those Japanese officers or enlisted wanted to tell their stories, but their culture really didn't allow that yeah. that traditional sense of disgrace or dishonor upon not only the the empire but as a, as a soldier? I mean, right. how many his, worldwide historical stories just have not been told because they've been stifled by cultures like the Middle East, which is my war, World Pete's War, war Germany. World War Two Germany, where this. Is just not going to happen. There was no freedom of the press. Right. I mean, they don't have, they don't have freedom of the press. What's freedom of the press? 
Yeah. And that's a, that's kind of our birthright, you know. I mean, we think, I've got a story, I'm going to tell it. They, yeah. People in other cultures don't feel that way. You're exactly right. I don't. Th- they may feel that way, but they know better. Because right. you, you write a book about this in Germany, guess what? You disappear. Mm. You write something against the government in Saudi Arabia on the news recently, you disappear. Crazy, it's, right? I mean, that's the type of perspective most Americans don't have. And they see these events... And all these great stories that could have been shared with the world right. to document what we've gone through during some of the worst periods. I mean, I, and we uh, learn from it. I uh, was a journalist uh, before I became an author, and there was a story, you know, speaking of things being emblematic, but this particular story really symbolized that for me. It was um, told to me by a police chief who was from Whitefish, Montana, who went over to Iraq to train Iraqi troops and police. And um, they had some interpreters there who were Iraqi who really risked their lives to work with the Americans. So one day, um, this police chief gets a visit from one of his interpreters who says to him, hey, last night some people came and knocked on my door and they told me if I didn't stop working with the Americans, they were going to come kill me and come kill my family. And so that happened to a lot of interpreters, and as a result, those interpreters quit. And I was thinking, what would Americans do if some guys showed up on their doorstep and said, if you don't do that? I think, you know, my husband would go back to the gun safe and return and say, come on in and let's talk about it. You know, (laughs) There's a whole whole chapter of that in my book. And Big Sam, who's the emblematic Terp, has been on the Break It Down show, yeah. oh, telling okay. his story. We're at my ranch in Temecula, and you're right. It is it is incomprehensible to think about that. I usually liken it to a bad episode of Cops. Like, can you imagine you watch these guys, they're in their trailer park, and the cops just smash their door in and ransack their house. You think it's, oh, that'll never happen to me in suburbia here in Oceanside, California. Or, yeah. But it that's commonplace in those areas, and I'm sure right. it was quite commonplace in Germany with... Nazi occupied Germany, especially. But just when when yeah. that person shows up on your, on the doorstep in Iraq, what is the response of the person inside the house versus showing up on my doorstep in East County? Yeah, San they're Diego? very desensitized to it because this has become their new normal, mm-hmm. and that's again something that most most Americans just won't get. Yeah, the thing too in Iraq is your ability to change that outcome. Right. Exactly. It. You have nothing because. You know, it was common to have a, a death letter. I'm sure Sam's family must have got death letters, night letters that would yeah. come with a threat. <clears throat> and what are you going to do, go to the police? It could be the police that sent it. What are the police going to do anyhow? <laughs> yeah. Like nothing. And so you have you have not only just the, the cultural don't tell this story, but there's the actual physical. People are able to create a physical threat. And then and then there's dead people in the market. You know, you're like, that guy got killed from doing something. You know, yeah. It really retards the ability to tell these stories and yeah the japanese culture you know i mean the fact that they survive in a war is is like shameful in a lot of ways oh it was shameful for them uh we tell a lot about that and uh one of the interesting things that we were able to do in indianapolis indian a lot of people don't know that the thing that sent indianapolis on her path to ultimately carry the opponents components of the atomic bomb to tinian island was the fact that she got hit by a kamikaze on march 31st 1945 Mm. so that's the reason we brought in you know admiral ugaki who was the kamikaze commander and got in his head because he has this huge journal i'm I know you can't see it on this podcast, but I'm making a, a motion to show how fat. It's like how, three inches. Yeah, like three inches thick. So uh, also there's a documentary called Day of the Kamikaze where some surviving kamikaze pilots talked about how they were pressured into serving. Because we, today we have this image that kamikaze pilots were, you know, gung-ho, everything for the emperor, I'm ready to die. And there were some like that but toward the end of the war these guys were teenagers coming right out of flight mm-hmm. school and they were given a form to sign a volunteer form and they could either sign their name next to eager mm-hmm. or, or get their head cut off n- or very <laughs> eager those were the two choices <laughs> i like that <laughs> that's a good it's commander like, thing yeah it's <laughs> like when, the, when we get our, our brief on talking to the press before you deploy you know, like, like you tell the truth, you can be honest, but here's your standard answer. The commander tells me I like it just fine. And you'll, be, you'll be able to stay out of, out of trouble. Yeah. If you like Indianapolis on Amazon, give it a five star review. If you hate it, give it a five star review. <laughs> right. For Lynn Vincent. And buy a bonus copy yeah. for your and friend. And buy a bonus copy for your friend. Christmas is coming. <laughs> yeah, but so 
Oh, shoot, I lost my thought. I was going to say gonna say about what Kamikazes. Yeah, yeah, kamikaze. Saki, thing. drinking, yes. crashing. So the kamikaze thing is crazy, too, because we had Ed Beakley on the show, and he, he studies, like, the, the Pacific fights and writes about it. And he's like, our culture allowed us to say, you guys have fought. Bring your stories back. Let's train the next guy. And we rotated people constantly so that you didn't just fight until you died. Whereas on the other side, like, they wanted to get into combat and, and, and do that, to go fight until they died. And it was such a different thing, and it, it creates a real outcome that is significantly different. I mean, it's easier for us to maintain our, our pilots because we have good pilots training bad pilots and then constantly developing new ones. What, what about the submarine war did Hashimoto find that was, like, problematic in terms of how everything ultimately comes together with the Indy? Well, the Japanese submarine fleet um, had its you know, big debut in terms of the American consciousness at Pearl Harbor. But even if you look back at that, the, their submarine fleet did very poorly at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And they continued to do poorly for lack of tactics, but also a lack of technology. Mm -hmm. And so Hashimoto, from about 1943 through 1944, went against protocol, banging on doors at all the, you know, bureaucratic offices around the Japanese Navy saying, hey, how about some radar? What do you think, guys? Yeah. Can we have some radar? Mm. He did that for months and months and months, and all he got was approval for one extra pair of binoculars. And so, and that's a true story. And, wow. and so he came to see over time, you know, that um, the submarine warfare between U.S. subs and Japanese subs, this is the way he put it, it became a fight be between the blind and those who could see. And so they, they didn't actually get radar installed until uh, late 1944. It's a little late in the game. A yeah, little late, late in the game. Because just a, a year over the horizon, yeah. they would soon have it all handed to them. <laughs> yeah, so We'd he, all go terribly sideways for the yeah. Japanese. He really resented yeah. the fact that um, <clears throat> the higher-ups in the Japanese Navy didn't... One pair of binos. One pair of that binos. That was it. Yep. Kind of like the Titanic. Hey, who's got the binos tonight? I don't know. I don't Pete, know. you got the binos? I need a jacket. Not a big deal. It's, it's cool. chilly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what a difference, right? And again, I, I imagine the culture, like, you know, you're, you're fighting to die in one case. The other one's fighting to win. And so you're likely fighting from a different point of view. And the Japanese found it fascinating that we put such a high premium on rescuing our guys. You know, yeah. so like like their view was, why would you waste manpower and fuel to go rescue a downed hmm. pilot in the middle of the ocean? You know, you just get some more pilots. But yeah. of course, over a lengthy war, that attrition, yeah. you know, doesn't really work out. Well, think about the second and third effects of that philosophy of leadership. That's as the war waned on. Why do you think guys didn't want to hop in the cockpit and, and drive it into a, a, a plane or pick up a rifle? U.S service members were jumping off their couches to yeah. hop in cockpits because they knew we take care of our own. We, right. and we never leave a man behind. And whether you're wounded or, or killed in action, I think that's, that's something that we wave as a banner as leaders in, in the military. And, and I, absolutely subscribe to us. So I think that probably has a lot to do with our recruitment efforts. Like, Hey, at least this organization is going to take care of us. We're not cannon fodder like the you know japanese uh you know soldiers were or the germans or the russians that just yeah leave them for, as you know cartwood stacked up on the side of the road it's exactly yeah it's interesting mm -hmm. yeah we do have certain cultural norms though like the captain goes down with his ship and obviously the captain ultimately i guess you could say fairly dies dies from this accident but it you know he kills himself years and years later but he never really gets over it. this is the way i understand it can you talk a little bit about the burden that he bears by surviving and, and really was their fault for him. I know they tried to bring charges against him, but how at fault was he, do you think? Well, he was at fault in this, in the sense that, you know, I'm a Navy vet. Mm -hmm. Are you Marine Corps, Scott? A retired Marine. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Army. Army. Right. So, you know, if you look in any manual of those three services, the captain is responsible for everything right. at yeah. the end of the day. So yeah. in that sense, he was absolutely responsible, um, but from a technical sense, you know, he was the only captain court-martialed for the loss of his ship 
in all of World War II. Right. Out of hundreds and mm-hmm. hundreds and hundreds of ships. And some really obvious bad decisions like Halsey and yeah. some of those people. You're like, what yeah. are you doing? Yeah. yeah. And and so he did not make a bad decision. Um, he was charged after the sinking of Indianapolis. He was, you know, uh, charged with failure to call abandoned ship in time, which was quickly proven untrue. And hazarding his ship by failing to zigzag. That was a that was a thing, zigzagging. So zigzagging was going steering back and forth across base course <laughs> as a way to throw off submarine <clears throat> commanders, um, and he was convicted of that. The truth of the matter was is that in the vast plain of the P- the Philippine Sea, Commander Hashimoto's boat I fifty eight happened to encounter Indianapolis. That's the guy with no radar. He's just got no. <laughs> he's got radar by then. Okay. He's got radar, but he didn't use it. It was a visual <laughs> attack. It was a visual attack. Did he have the binos? Oh, uh, he did use the binos. Yeah. He did use the binos. Uh, the one Japanese did set of he binos. he have someone from Vet Ticks on his submarine getting a free ride? Well, yeah. I, mm. no, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> Vet Ticks is going to love us. <laughs> so, so it was one of those things where um, all the circumstances uh, lined up for mm-hmm. these two vessels to meet in the dead center of the Philippine Sea on a very cloudy, dark night at a moment when the moon happened to break through the clouds, mm. providing the opportunity for Hashimoto to spot this, you know, this huge heavy cruiser. And was Hashimoto's crew, were they, were they putting American ships down on the bottom of the ocean often? Or No. They? As a matter of fact, Hashimoto was feeling quite a bit of shame as the war drew to a close because he'd, had, he'd sunk a couple of vessels early on, but he hadn't sunk a major vessel for many years. And that was sort of, I mean, this mission that he was on was part of what was called the Taman Group. There were four um, attack submarines that carried suicide torpedoes. Are you familiar with those? They were called Kai-10. So Mm -hmm. they were manned suicide torpedoes. Mm -hmm. And everybody knew that Japan was on its last legs, including these guys, these submarine commanders. And so he really just wanted to go out and save face and bring home one more major prize for the emperor. And he did that. Talk a little bit about these suicide torpedoes, though, because I don't know that everybody else knows about that. Okay, they're about 60 feet long, just barely big enough for a man to sit down in it and they would be lashed to the exterior of the mother sub and then when it was time to attack they would be let go and they were self-propelling and the pilot could and they they would dress in uh fondoshi which is the traditional japanese undergarment that's all they were wearing and once they were the the kaiten pilots were even they were 100 percent fatalities a kamikaze pilot could develop engine trouble and return to base. Mm. Right. Um, but once the Kaiten pilot was let go from the mother submarine, it was it was done. So he could line up on his target and take a run at it. If he missed, he could take another run at it. But if he failed to to hit his mark, there were only two things he could do. He could either um, blow himself up. Or he could go down to the bottom of the ocean and suffocate. That was it. <laughs> and they had an extraordinarily bad record. Um, the Kaitens did not sink Indianapolis. These were uh, f- five, uh, excuse me, six Type 95 torpedoes that sank Indianapolis. Two, he fired a spread. Hashimoto fired a spread of six. Mm-hmm. Two of them hit. The first one blew off the bow of Indianapolis, causing it to be like a funnel that was just sucking in seawater. And the second one hit amidships and um, blew up some am- ammunition stores. But it wasn't the Kaitens that hit him. Could the ship have survived either of the hits <coughs> independently? Um, probably not the bow hit, uh, perhaps the hit amidships, mm-hmm. but, um, these ships were treaty cruisers. Indianapolis was a treaty cruiser. So she had this one long through deck because it was, she was actually, uh, let's see, she was christened in 1932. Her keel was laid in 1930. So she was 15 years old. So she was an older cruiser. And, uh, when they designed these cruisers, they had this through deck, and the only way to keep the ship open for easy passage of personnel among the decks was to keep some of the compartments open. Mm. If those compartments were closed, then personnel would have to, you know, go down this ladder and up this ladder and across this deck and up this other ladder, and that was very inefficient. In addition, in the steaming hot Pacific, you could suffocate the crew if you stayed completely buttoned up. Mm. So they operated in something called uh, yoke mod which is a damage control, watertight integrity uh, condition. Mm -hmm. And 
what that did, did was it left this through deck open. It really compromised the watertight integrity of the ship. So she was, it was widely believed by the officers aboard that even a single torpedo hit hmm. that she would not have survived. What, what type of ship were you on when you were in the Navy? I was not on a ship. You were not on a ship. I was an air traffic controller. Okay. And it, in those dark retrograde days, women were not allowed on combatant ships. But since then, have you been on, as you wrote the book, did they get you out on a frigate? Did you get like some firsthand favors thrown in? Like, hey, we want to have you on board. And We were going to go out on the destroyer USS Spruance, which was named for Admiral Spruance, the 5th Fleet Commander, whose flagship was Indianapolis. But we never could get our schedules aligned. So what we did instead was we went to Quincy Harbor near Boston and went on the USS Salem, which is the only heavy cruiser from World War II still afloat. Hmm. So we were able to, you know, really do an authentic job of describing the interior ship because yeah. we went on a ship just like Indianapolis. Yeah, it's it's a unique experience. Pete, any ship time? No, even never. on a tour. Like I, you know, I've been stuffed away for months on end on those yeah, things. But I've, uh, I've done, I've done some uh, tour stuff. Uh, let's see. Well, what have you been I've stuffed seen. inside of? Never. Whenever when I was active, never. Just, uh, just have you ever done it? Submarine tour, been inside a sub. Yeah, I know I have. I just can't think. Have you been inside a sub? The Disney, the Disneyland sub, right? No, I don't Disney fit on does that. not count. I don't yeah. fit on that ride. Like you know, the, the, the <laughs> portal is down here, and so I'm like, I can't. It's oh. crazy nuts, and the movies do not do that justice. So this yeah. this Japanese commander who's like lobbing torpedoes and human torpedoes at this yeah. this cruiser. I don't think that is a special breed of person to get stuffed in a tube that sinks to the bottom of the ocean with about, you know, 100 plus other dudes. Yeah. Because in U571 or the Widowmaker with, you know, Harrison Ford, it looks so roomy and spacious and they're cruising around the controls. And now it's yeah. a horribly cramped, claustrophobic environment. And that that is being on ship is bad enough where you have to yeah. brush up against people and smell everybody yeah, and the everybody. food and, and the oil and the hydro. But in a sub, it's just, it's, it's almost indescribable. If you haven't done it, well, we were do, really, do really privileged to develop a really close relationship with Captain Bill Toady, who was the commander of USS Indianapolis, the submarine, and who was instrumental in um, exonerating Captain McVeigh. So mm. we got a lot of good detail, visual and all kinds of sensory detail about what it was like to be inside a sub. And then also Commander Hashimoto's book had a lot of interesting details. So, you know, like, <clears throat> for example... The, the pervasive smells inside a Jap Japanese submarine in the World War II era were pickled fish mm -hmm. and sewage. Hmm. So, so you got that going for so you. So they got that going nice. for them. Yeah. Plus, plus, the Japanese submarines were just famous for being crawling with rats. Um, and so Commander Hashimoto even told his guys hmm. that he would give anybody 20 yen cash and an extra day of shore leave if they killed a rat. <laughs> Because so they ate the wiring and stuff, I bet, inside yeah. the ships. Like, it was cool. Because yeah, you don't have enough going against you, right. friction-wise, <laughs> being submerged with yeah. all that pressure. No literally, radar. Little yeah. pressure. No radar. Binos no radar. Only. One set but, of binos that's sacks, lost. Sacks and sacks of rice, yeah. right? The, yeah. the rats are loving that. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing is, is this is not like, like you said, they're always underwater in the movies. You know, yeah. But these these submarines didn't go underwater nearly as much in World War II, right? It was a lot of time cruising along on your diesel engine, and then you dive if something was coming on, right? Well, I'm not sure about the proportion, but mm -hmm. you are right that they did spend a lot of time cruising on the surface. And they did spot Indianapolis when they were on the surface. They, they surfaced in the center of the Philippine Sea to take, yeah. <clears throat> to take a bearing, to take a celestial bearing. And they were like, holy crap. <clears throat> There's a, there's a ship. So then they sank, you know, then they submerged. Think about how hard that is, Scott. Yeah. Like, you're looking for ships, you don't have radar, and you have to constantly be able to charge your battery. You're a researcher. Go grab us a book over here at Oceanside Barnes and Nobles about submarines, and let's, <laughs> let's get an answer to that. Wait, we've got Google. No, we yeah. still. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's impossibly hard to. to it's do nuts that. to think about that. Yeah. You know, especially the lack of technology that Lynn was describing too with the radar. The, I mean, this isn't even accounting for the limited communications they had mm -hmm. with, you know, just standard UHF VHF comms back then. Which yeah. Well, and they, they didn't have GPS. Right. You know, yeah. they didn't oh, yeah. have, I mean. Yeah, you had to take a star reading. You had to and take a celestial bearing, yeah. If there were stars up there, you know, like if it's all clouds, you have to dead Because it was it. a dark, cloudy night. Yeah, exactly. Is that how the book starts? 
It was a dark, stormy night. It was a dark, stormy Last night. Last night was a dark, stormy night. It was here in Southern California, <laughs> oh which we were happy gosh. about. Crazy lightning storm. Yeah. Yeah, we had lightning, too. <laughs> we, most people that will be listening to this nationwide or around the world will say, what's so big about a storm? We're like, yeah, we live in Southern California. It's the first one this year, isn't it? Well, first real one. It, okay, first real for, one. The, for those of you who are listening around the world in places where it could just rain any old day, here in Southern California, San Diego in particular, if yeah. it rains... There is live team coverage. Yeah, on yeah the news. live team coverage. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. If, I want to. Also, we have a big audience in Japan. Somehow we've oh, done okay. that. So, so go Japan. But the other thing about that commander who runs the submarine is, you come up. If someone else sees you, there's not a whole lot you can do. You know, you can go run around for a while, but you're probably going to the bottom. Especially if a destroyer sees you. Right. Talk yeah. about that a little bit. Like how when when he's. Trying to keep his, he's trying to be on the offense, but there is really no defense. Well, there really was no defense for him because he was a, basically an offensive weapon only. All they had was a deck mounted machine gun and torpedoes. So if he was trying to, if he ran into a destroyer, all he could do was run. In the case of Indianapolis, that's a very important point because typically a cruiser would travel in company with at least one or two destroyers. Right, yes. Because Indianapolis had no underwater sound detection. Heavy cruisers had no underwater sound detection. So they would travel with an escort ship, mm. either a destroyer or a destroyer escort. So Hashimoto, when he saw this big capital ship, this heavy cruiser, he assumed that there were destroyers in the area. So he needed to dive, hurry up and dive, hurry up and make his attack, and then get the heck out of there. But as it one of the big controversial problems with Indianapolis is that no destroyer escorts were sent with her across the Philippine Sea. Why not? This episode of the Break It Down show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. One of the big controversial problems with Indianapolis is that no destroyer escorts were sent with her across the Philippine Sea. Why not? The reason why... Is right, let me say that. Why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> and Q. <laughs> why not? The reason why is because the Philippine Sea, that part of the Philippine Sea was considered the backwater of the war. By that time, in July of 1945, the entire war effort was focused on the home islands of Japan. You remember, in, um, rem remember by that time, in the spring of 1945, Okinawa had been captured. That was the last stepping stone on the way to a, a mainland invasion of Japan. So at that point in the war, everyone, remember the Manhattan Project was mm. so ultra secret that no one knew about it. No, no one. Um, just a handful. Um, and so everyone thought that the next step was a, a home island invasion of the Japanese mainland. And so that's where all the attention was focused. That's where all the intelligence apparatus was focused. That's where all the firepower was focused. Down in, on uh, Route Petty between Guam and the Philippines, which is like a straight westbound shot across the Philippine Sea, that was considered safe. Nothing going on there. Japanese on their last legs. And that's why they didn't send an escort with um, Indianapolis. If they had, even if Hashimoto had sunk the ship, only about 300 men would have died mm. instead of um, almost 900, 879. Mm. Because the other, when, when, the, when the torpedoes hit the ship, the vessel went down in 12 minutes. I mean, that's like one segment on a sitcom yeah right 12 minutes and two-thirds of the crew were sleeping because it was the middle of the night it was just after midnight 300 men go down with the ship a little under 900 men go in the water they stayed there for five nights and four days because the navy didn't know they were missing so the great bulk of loss of life accrues to the lack of rescue not the sinking so let's talk about that how the heck does that i mean we just said we rescue our own we come after them what the heck happens? What breaks down? Well, it was uh, what Sebastian Younger famously brought into our lexicon, a perfect storm. It mm -hmm. was a perfect storm. So 
Um, there was a lack of intelligence. How many plugs has Sebastian gotten on this show? Uh, Never enough. Never enough. He's been yeah. on the show. Never enough. Uh, I love that book, by the way. When yeah. I grow up, I want to be him. Yeah. So, um, so lack of intelligence. Uh, the the there was a. I mean, there's a lot of people who know we had this highly, highly, highly most classified intelligence program called Ultra. Mm -hmm. The people who were privileged to get that information knew about the Taman group. They knew that there were four submarines coming down to the southern Philippine Sea. They even had positioned I-58 based on uh, message traffic and intercepts. They had positioned I-58 pretty much on the route between Guam and the Philippines. Did they tell Captain McVeigh about it? No. Good answer. They did not tell Captain this McVeigh time it's about Pete it. Pete wants Scott Zero. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they did. So competitive. <laughs> you know, Marines, we're not competitive at all. Not, not at all. <laughs> so even though they knew that, they did still not. Uh, they still didn't send an escort ship with him. Um, in addition, another reason that the Navy didn't know that Indianapolis was missing is because of those two catastrophic torpedo hits. All communications were severed. So you have some really heroic men literally going down with the ship, literally, trying to get an SOS off, but no one receives it. Hmm. There were some reports of some fragmentary messages, but mm -hmm. no one received it. In addition... Was there anybody else in the area at all? Nobody in the area at all. Hmm. So Hashimoto sails away, and then he transmits a message to his higher command saying, Hey, I sank a ship, and here's the position. Here's the time. Yeah. Okay? U.S. intelligence intercepts that message, but they don't follow up on it. Hmm. And so no one knows that Indianapolis is missing. So the men are out there for five nights and four days. Now, only, only about 30 of, 30 of those 900 men that went into the water are on rafts. The rest of them either only have life jackets or nothing. And so they're out there. They're battling, as very famously, the sharks. They're battling dehydration. Yeah. They're battling the elements. They're battling their injuries. Some of them on the third day start to drink salt water and if you uh, there's a condition called hypernatremia that mm -hmm. is the result of drinking salt water so they started to go out of their minds if they didn't go out of their minds their bu blood vessels burst in their heads um, drinking salt water is a very horrible way to die and pretty soon even uh, they started to have group hallucinations so there would be you know a few dozen men in a group and someone would say, look, Indianapolis didn't sink her after all. She's right down there under the water. Let's go down and get some ice cream. Let's go down and get some lemonade. And they would dive under the water as a group. And, of course, they would drown and not come back up. Wow. By the time they were accidentally spotted by a patrol bomber, there were only 300. And, well, there were, there were more than 316 men uh, still alive. Um, only 316 men were ultimately, you know, made it safe to shore. Yeah. But the reason we know there were more is because both rescuers and survivors reported people dying even as rescue was underway. Yeah, they're dying by the minute at this point. Yeah. So from the point that when someone goes, holy cow, there's a bunch of our men down there till, till they can get a boat or a plane or something on, on the water. To help. How long is that? Well, that's a really great question. Um, oh, <laughs> to nothing. Touche, Turner. <laughs> Touche, my good man. So so there's a, a PV-1 Ventura that is doing the regular sec sector search, right? They have a trailing antenna wire that they're going to test to see if they can get better long-distance transmission. But it keeps getting tangled and snapping and whirling like a, like a whip in the back of the plane. <clears throat> so they decide that they're going to reel it in. So they open a hatch in the belly of the plane and they look down and they see an oil slick, mm. okay, because a lot of fuel oil was spilled into the water when Indianapolis sank. So the pilot, Lieutenant Chuck Gwynn, rushes back to the cockpit and he says, prepare for attack. He's going to attack because the typical thing that causes an oil slick is a, uh, the diesel trail that a, that a submarine leaves after it submerges. So he thinks it's an enemy submarine. So they're opening the bomb bay doors, they're arming the weapons, and they're diving and descending down to the surface. And when they get about 300 feet off the deck, they see these lumps in the oil. 
and they look like bumps on a cucumber. And so Lieutenant Gwen is like, what in the heck are those? So he flies down a little lower, and then he can see men in the water splashing and waving their arms and screaming, help us. You know, he can't hear it, but they're yeah. screaming and yelling. And so he secures from the bomb run, and he starts to fly around the area, and he can't believe what he's seeing. But still, he doesn't need know if these are Americans because everybody's faces are covered in oil. He doesn't know who it is, what it is. Right. He hasn't been told that a ship has been sunk. Crazy. So what happens next? Oh, I you gotta read you the book. Asked. You gotta read the book, man. Don't make so her give it all away. Yeah. <laughs> what happens next is he calls it in, and uh, somehow um, he determines that they're Americans. I, I'm not remembering exactly how Lieutenant Gwen figured out that they were Americans, but um, he did because he ro- at, at one point survivors talk about him rocking his wings. And which is which is know, not a crime, not like zigzagging, no, not, not like court zigzagging. martial event. Rocking his wings to acknowledge yeah. a friendly—that's what he yeah. does. So, what happens next is um, uh, he radios to back to Peleliu, which is at the southern—you know exactly where Peleliu is, Marine. Yeah, uh, thanks for okay. I want thanks for Peleliu. Yeah. You're welcome. My pleasure. Bottom of the Philippine Sea. So. A pilot named uh, Lieutenant Adrian Marks takes off and zooms up there because they they don't want Gwen to leave the scene because it was a miracle that these guys were spotted in the first place. And if he flies away, they yeah. may never be found again. So Marks goes up there, flies his Ventura up there, and his uh, his men are looking down in the water. And even as they are looking down there, men are being eaten by sharks. Mm. So he... <laughs> is not supposed to do this, but he says, you know what, I'm going to land in the water. Now, his, his uh, PBY Catalina was designed to land on the water, but not in 12-foot swells, which is why it's against regulations for these guys to land in the water. So he radios back to base that they're... That is court-martial offense, yes. landing in 12-foot yeah. swells. Yeah. So Worse than zigzagging, in my opinion. Worse than zigzagging, I don't know. or not zigzagging. <laughs> failure, failure to zigzag, sorry. So this is pilot risks his life his crew his plane to land because he he he's a lawyer in civilian right. life and but he's he's there's nothing in his life that so he's he trained for this his yeah. whole life <laughs> he's lives. absolutely trained for that that's a you know that's that's heroism right yeah. there at its best just abandoning all yeah. reason and hope and saying you know i'm just gonna land my plane in but this, this was his personality yeah. here was mm-hmm. a guy who had already graduated from northwestern law school already clerked at the Supreme Court, married the Indiana Supreme Court justice's daughter. You're basic underachiever. Yeah, mm-hmm. basic underachiever. Yeah. He's one of those guys that has never attempted something in life that he didn't conquer. And so he's like, I don't care if it's against the rules. There are men in the water. I'm in a position to save them. I'm going to do it. So he lands, and it's a very dramatic scene, uh, both in life and in the book. And he's able to rescue 53 men. But the ships, the surface ships that are going to rescue the rest are still 12 hours away. Mm-hmm. So they come steaming up, they come steaming up, and um, the first two on the scene are USS Cecil J. Doyle and USS Bassett. Still, no one knows that it's the men from Indianapolis who have, it, that Indianapolis has sunk. Mark finds out, but he doesn't dare broadcast that over the air, that the, the, fl- fish, sure. that the flagship has been sunk. So Bassett gets there, and it's after midnight, and it's dark. You know, it's starting to be uh, very, very huge swells, rainy. They send out two LCVPs, landing craft vehicle and personnel, and uh, one of them is uh, in com- under the command of a young ensign named Peter Wren. So they still don't know who or what has been sunk. They come up on this black mass of men. You know, their faces are covered. All he can see is black faces and big white eyes doesn't know is this the enemy is this lynn's making goggle symbols with her fingers (laughs) just so you know she's doing that for our benefit but i wanted to share that with the rest of the audience so using on the board (laughs) see i'm handling all the softball stuff today usually i'm the academic right because i went to state but uh (laughs) so so peter wren motors up to this group all they've got to light light the way is a battle lantern that they're holding up which i am now holding up yes you know. yes yeah. there's a young girl in the children's section here at bars noble looking at you very strangely <laughs> yeah so peter wren pulls up and he's got his sidearm and he pulls out his sidearm and he points it at this group and he says who are you and what ship are you from 
and the answer comes back just like a dumbass officer asking dumbass questions. <laughs> English, weapon on safe. I won't take offense to that since I'm an officer, but I was enlisted too. So, yeah, if it comes back in English, weapon on safe. Yeah. Anything yeah. else? You're cleared hot. It's funny that the weapon's out even too. You got dudes just floating in the ocean. You yeah, know? and like yeah. sailors are trained on weapons anyway. These guys yeah. like quick. This, yeah. Oh, so sorry. that's when Peter Wren said he knew these were definitely American sailors. So the the rescue gets underway on that end, and then think about. I mean, that's a, you s- recite that story is a- almost you know the, in the cinematic vision, but to really understand that type of friction. I mean, this is it's pitch black. You're in the middle of the ocean, bobbing up and down in an oil slick, kicking sharks off of yeah. you, and then you got some jackass lands his plane thinking he's really helping you out. Who knows how many guys he landed on as he <laughs> as he dishes the plane in the middle of the ocean at night yeah. to try and help his brothers out and then he doesn't even know who he's helping out no no no, no. He was on a- a- Adrian Mark's landed during the day okay time. Mark's landed during the day Ren, okay Ren is at, Ren is at night um, Ren's at night 12 hours later in yeah. a landing craft right? yeah any landing oh yeah craft. In the landing craft yeah right. but, but, uh, but the hilarious thing about that and this is what Peter Wren said these guys still had spirit they still had spirit well, yeah he leaves know? with a joke yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah like, no just kidding like a dumb ass yeah that guy wants food so bad at a drink but he's like I still got a wisecrack for you yeah yeah so who was that guy? Do we know? Uh, no. Oh, wow. So Bassett rescues 150 something guys. Doyle rescues another. I don't know. I can't remember a couple dozen guys. Mm-hmm. And um, the rescue takes three or four days. Jeez. They wow. finally bring in search planes the next morning and they start canvassing the area. And in the end, um, they pulled. Now, this is sad. They pulled 320 living survivors out of the water, but four of them died on the way. To the hospital. Mm. Can you imagine yeah. the tragedy of hanging on that long, and then ultimately Just not making it? Not enough it. time left. Yeah. yeah, that that's crazy. Yeah. So, obviously, it's a massive endeavor because you're telling the Japanese side, you're telling the people that rescue, and all of these different stories. What didn't make the cut that you're like, oh, I wish we had room for this, but we just don't? Because there has to be just a, another 150 great stories that you didn't have room for. Oh, there were absolutely those. Um, as a matter of fact, after we turned in our first draft, our editor, you know, after, I mean, he loved it, but he came back three, three months into the editing and said, you know, I have a feeling we need to get to the sinking sooner. Okay, so his, his um task for us was to cut 50 pages out of the first 200 because it's a pretty thick book too i mean yeah. it, like it's, okay so is it's it's like this no, no, thing no, no, is no. it th- no, no, no. it's three only four, 400 uh, some pages the, the story is only like 460 pages there's about 100 pages of end notes and bibliography and stuff like that wow. but but that's a lot yeah. of work his <clears throat> point his point was that you know you need to get to the you know the big event faster we ended up cutting out 30 pages and you asked what did we cut Mm -hmm. well it it was more um like stuff that were illuminate character things Mm -hmm. that would develop character particular anecdotes that we really liked um but the genius of our editor is this is that after we cut that stuff out i don't miss it oh good i don't miss it yeah. I'm like, uh, well, that was really the right call because we were able to cut out 30 pages and it was fine. That That's a difficult task to eliminate stuff you fall in love with as a writer, as an artist. Like, oh, this is the best song or this is the best chapter. And they're like, nope, that chapter's got to go. And I, had, that's tough. I have I had entire chapters that just did not make the cut. And I would challenge any listener, like, okay, write an email to your best friend and then say, I tell you, just delete 30 words and see which 30 words you're going to delete, let alone an important story about these brave sailors and service members that have done so much. And to say, ah, but, you know, at the end of the day, no one wants to read a book this thick either. Then the story never gets told. So you really do have to choose those emblematic stories that are going to represent what everybody did otherwise it just doesn't get told and that's a that's a balance huh it was a big team effort to make those cuts um editors don't get any credit either oh i know you get this good shout out you gave your guy who is it who's your editor his name is jofie ferrari adler he is at simon and schuster jofie 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 good job jofie his parents were hippies so so juliana hobner was the associate editor or his editorial assistant and so she went through and she identified places that she thought could be cut and then we went back, and it was like this negotiation, like, 
no, we need to keep that because that develops something that happens later on. So if you don't introduce mm. that here, you, you know, and like that. And so between, you know, her identifying places and our, us identifying places, we actually cut out, you know, that's what is uh, 30 times 250. That's how many words it was. I don't do it's math in public. That's it's a lot. lot. It's like 7,000 words. Yeah, that's a lot. It's yeah. like 7,000 words. It's a whole short words. story. Yeah. It's like three chapters, basically. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. You guys lose 30 pages, and, and those stories are, are out there for something, someone else to put into something. But what what do you walk away from this whole experience with? Like, you tell this story. It wasn't like this was the co-author's baby. You were there to help out. But what do you what do you pull out of the whole experience? Well, it actually turned out to be both of our babies because, oh, okay. because we she was focusing on, when she wrote her screenplay and everything, um, early on she was focusing on uh the stories of the men and when i came in we we had more of a broader vision and so it was kind of in the back of the book we talk about okay this was the part that she handled Mm -hmm. this is the part that i handled you know and what what we walk away what i walked away with was it was really the most um it was probably the most satisfying project that i've ever done Mm -hmm. only because i had to call on everything that i've learned through journalism, through writing memoirs, through collaboration, um, through really deciding what's true and not true. Because working for a, a national news magazine, that was something that I faced a lot, deciding, okay, my editor, Marvin Olasky, I always have him sitting on my shoulder, whispering in my ear, how do you know this is true? Mm-hmm. And so being able to write a definitive history of this iconic event is something that really left me with a sense of satisfaction, not only professionally speaking, but, you know, in a way to honor these men and their families. So what do you want the reader to walk away with when they, when you finish this book? Is it historical? Is it informative? Is it emotional? What what do you want what is Scott Husing going to get out of this when I when well, I close that book and I say, God, I well, never thought it would be this. You're going to be crying, okay? When when Scott or anybody else finishes the book, you're going to be crying. What we tried to do was, you know, neither I, like my go-to books that I'm I like suspense, you know, I like I like mystery, I like thriller, and so what we tried to do was write a serious naval history that reads like an adventure novel like a suspense novel. And not only that, but that you really get to know these men. It's not just mm-hmm. dates and facts and figures yeah. and this battle that happened. So one word, time. one word, what do I get out of it? I can't do it in one You're word. You're wordsmith. No, I can't Challenge. Do it in one this word. is what I do. This is like where we jump off the tracks. Like one word, I walk away with. An emotional history. Emotional history. Is there a hyphen in it? Emotional history? No, it's two words. Okay, two Definitely words. Definitely two right. words. Emotional history. I like that. I'm totally going to steal that. It's an that. emotional... Well, that would be really three it. words. And emotional history. Pete did not go to state. And I get credit for Actually, the first third-person injection. What does Scott... Yeah. What I didn't say the Scott, but... You wonder if Scott knows <laughs> that you actually did go to state. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, man. The thing I always wonder about these things is... is Amelia Earhart, is, we're stuck with her forever. We She just... We cannot get over her. We cannot get over the Pony Express. But we don't care about the USS Houston or any of the other heavy cruisers that sunk. <laughs> Why the Indy? I think the Indy is uh, iconic not only because of, you know, the fact that she carried the ac- atomic bomb, mm-hmm. um, but because of this incredible survival story. You know, five nights and four yeah. days in the water, unprecedented. There are a lot of superlatives in the Indianapolis story. So the atomic bomb story is a superlative. Uh, yeah. The fact that McVeigh was the only captain ever court-martialed for the loss of his ship in combat in World War Failure II. Failure to zigzag. Failure to zigzag. What a jackass. Uh, Who doesn't zigzag? That's so, that's so military, too. Like the yeah, guy that that's, lands the plane. Okay. Is yeah. Is Failure to zigzag still a naval regulation? Listeners want to know. I is it doubt, still in the books? I, I sincerely doubt it. Like you can beat your wife on the courthouse steps in South Carolina still today or something random. Like our Navy never catches up, our military. Yeah. I wonder, I'm I'll tell get, you what is still relevant today is that our military still f- tries to pin blame at the lowest level. So that is similar to what happened in Indianapolis. It's what happened in my book, Dog Company. Um, it's what happened at, well, not so much Pearl Harbor, but you see it throughout military history is that the more the 
American military grows, the more the leadership tends to protect itself. Yeah, yeah. who was the highest ranking person at Abu Ghraib that did any kind of serious threat to their I think a one star got relieved in that event, but it, it just goes to show you know whether it's civil, criminal law in America yeah. or in the military, like all those horrific examples like I just gave, like in South Carolina, like, yeah. the, that stuff people just never purge that from our culture, and we think that these you know puritanicals that wrote yeah. some of this ridiculous law, we haven't caught up with that you know from our legal system and in the military. We've got the best doctor in 1980 to offer. Yeah. So it's not not surprising, but I, I actually should ask nuts. my son uh, that question that you just asked about the zigzagging because he's a sonar tech on the USS Truxton. Uh, Get him on the phone right now. Uh, and they should maybe call it McVeighing instead. McVeighing. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a the slap guy that in the lands face. the plane. You know, it would not at all surprise me if you were to say he got the Navy Cross and court-martialed. You know, uh, <laughs> like, yeah. that's such a military thing to do. That, you know? Yeah, that's not that wouldn't surprise me. Right, like yeah, he was exonerated, but he did have to stand in front of people. Or he got his know? paycheck for screwing the plane up or something like you broke the <laughs> like, you yeah. broke the wingtip. You're getting yeah. uh, you know you broke the, the foot <laughs> you're paying antenna. for that. Yeah, yeah, That's he got chastised for not completing the not not beyond uh, reason within the military. Yeah. Well, uh, anything else you want to throw in there about the book? We're about an hour here. Well, um, I, I I'm really glad you asked the question about what people are going to get out of the book. Uh, one of the things that we tried to do, um, by the way, I, I didn't mention this. We don't just stay at sea. And we don't just stay in a court martial. We go and find out. We go and we visit the home front. You know, what was it like to be that mother who got the telegram that said mm. Indianapolis went down with 100% casualties? What was it like to be that wife who sent her husband to sea and then gets the, the horrible telegram? So we have um, female characters woven throughout the book on yeah. the home front. And that's part of what makes it a really emotional story is because a lot of military stories are told, you know, mainly from the military side. But this also weaves in the family. And it also follows uh, the men after um, after the court martial to find out how did this impact their lives? You know, some of the, some of these men, you know, as the greatest generation yeah. is famous for. <laughs> picked up themselves and, and went on into life, but some of them couldn't hold a job. Yeah. Some of them became alcoholics, you know, and, and so we follow that as I'm well. I'm going to go back to the history section where the books are sitting. I'm going to write emotional history, and there's going to be a whole new section. You're just, re you're like defining how Barnes & Noble does business in Amazon. <laughs> like, there's going to be an emotional history section. Like, the really kick-ass history books that are, really speak to the emotion and the people and the feeling, like, which you know is my thing. Like, without that, I think it all is worthless yeah. if you don't tell those stories it's and, and a, well, that's history, a great job sharing history those. is is is, yeah. is created by people you know and yeah. sometimes we get so far into the facts and figures we forget that yeah well i'm glad we got to link up here at oceanside yeah. barnes and noble yeah, on the break it down show we got some shout outs today from your editor again <laughs> Sebastian uh, Younger. Sebastian, Sebastian got another one. Yeah. We created a new Navy Shark uh -huh. Award, <laughs> yeah. fending off sharks. That's that's going to happen. I'll write, I'll write something about that. McVeigh. McVeigh has yeah. been... Yeah, we never found out if drinking salt water your own urine is how the kamikaze shot was invented, but it's a horrible shot. Yeah. 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 Horrible. Well, thank you very much. Come back again sometime. All right. Absolutely. Perfect.